Okay, let's resume public meeting number 39. Um, next on the agenda are a couple more questions of mine. I'm combining key policy question number eight, which is should the commission make casino licensing decisions region by region or simultaneously for all regions? With key policy question number 19, how will the commission consider the strategic implications of when how and where to issue licenses, including the slots license, in the context of other license issuing decisions so as to maximize the benefits to the Commonwealth as a whole. This was basically a matter of, you know, how much should we think about the location of these next and the sequencing of these um, relative to maximizing the, the financial benefits. Then we added a second uh, question, a second part to policy question 19, should the slots license applicants be investigated first, and to what degree should resources, both investigations and drafting regulations, be allocated for the slots license in anticipation of or after January 15th, in, other, in order to expedite uh, the slots uh, license award? Um, I put the two together since the submissions uh, frequently related and the two questions are very much interrelated. We had seven uh, written submissions on these questions. Um, the uh, Sterling Suffolk race course said that there was no legislative intent uh, to uh, uh, sequence the, uh, what is it, category two with the casino licenses. Um, Shevsky and Freilich for the city of Springfield said speed, the priority is speed to spur the benefits. Um, so sequencing in that sense is not a good idea but it was important to consider the locations of the license in order to minimize, minimize cannibalization. Uh, Brown Rudnick with MGM Springfield said sequencing decisions, if you were to sequence in a row as opposed to simultaneously would allow an industry head start to whoever was licensed first and delay the flow of revenue to the Commonwealth from the later licensees. Uh, Martha Robinson said uh, that sequencing would be a good idea because it would give the Commission time to focus its resources on each case in a row, each uh, license in a row. Philip Cataldo said sequence because different regions have different needs. Paul Vignoli said to license the slots last, uh, permitting the losing casino bidders to compete for the slots license. And the City of Boston, uh, similar to Suffolk, said that the intent of the law was to maximize the benefits to the Commonwealth and therefore we should move ASAP and not sequence. Um, we also talked at great length with our consultants um, the, the, about this. Uh, they really made two different points. One is that there is a clear intent in the law that you can both see in the words and also impute from its drafting uh, that speed is important. Um, but they also, uh, and that to sequence would delay the process, uh, and whether you would gain competition by delaying the process in that way or not is totally speculative. On the other hand, they did point out that siting two of these facilities close to each other will degrade the value of both, um, and will they will cannibalize one another for uh, their own each of their cash flows so that if there is a way to manage the siting so as to keep them strategically located around the Commonwealth, there's a benefit to that, um, but not at the cost of timing, basically. They also said that, you know, to try to be really informed about locating these things is an illusory aspiration because there's so many variables, uh, some internal in the Commonwealth and uh, a lot external that, um, paying a high price for, for uh, location perfection is uh, probably doesn't make a lot of sense because there are so, variables we, so many variables we can't control. They also suggested there's a considerable possibility that once we know by January 15, everybody who's in the game, that we will know where at least where the, all the prospective applicants are, and we may have a pretty good idea of locations anyway. Um, so. Um, after thinking about this quite a bit, um, my, uh, uh, my sense is that although locating two licenses close together is suboptimal, 
uh, and it is a possible consequence of what we're doing, what I'm going to recommend, that the legislative intent to move as quickly as possible to generate jobs and other economic benefits is the greater good. Therefore, um, we should make the license decision on regions A and B at approximately the same time, um, not sequence them consciously, mitigated only by delays beyond our control, such as the receipt of the applications, obviously. Um, B, we should consider the, to the extent possible the benefits of spreading the licenses rationally around the Commonwealth in order to maximize the economic return to the applicants and to the Commonwealth and to service the most people conveniently, since convenience is clear uh, a priority in how people choose their casinos. But we should not hold the, li the slots license artificially in abeyance uh, at, and to wait until after the casino decisions are made in order to consider its impact on the casino licensees. And C, um, and this is the one I wrestled with the most, um, I think there's something to be said in a jurisdiction like Massachusetts where uh, there is still a tremendous amount of controversy about the expanded gaming business um, and the legislature went out of its way and the governor went out of uh, his way to talk about destination casinos, destination resorts, to talk about all the additional benefits, uh, to try to discourage in effect the simple convenience casinos that are, that are kind of down and dirty um, and to maximize the broader benefits. Um, there is something to be said for having an opportunity to license the grandest of whatever it is we're going to license first to kind of create the best impression and, and get the Commonwealth ready for what some people still find troublesome, um, and maybe to license the Category 1 license first is sort of less than desirable from that standpoint. But having said that, um, I do recommend that we uh, attempt to license the, the slots parlor first and uh, in order to generate the jobs and, and economic development benefits uh, and the revenue flow um, obviously that's going to be mitigated by when the applications come in but to the extent that we can allocate resources to move the slots parlor along more quickly I think there is a net benefit in that we're going to have to walk a line making sure that we don't compromise the casino licenses, but if we can constructively move the Category 1 license forward, I think we should. If I could speak to that, um, I, I agree with your conclusions. Um, I'd also like to say that I have seen many facilities that are slots only, and they are not unattractive or something less than. They may have fewer amenities. And the, the, the area in which to gamble would be considerably smaller, but they it can be a very, very <coughs> nice facility. Um, secondly, to speak to the investigative piece, uh, certainly I, I'm working firsthand with that, and um, we have the investigative resources we need to put a team on each, each applicant. So there is, we will not slow down the process uh, with the emphasis on focusing on slots first. That will not slow down. They will, uh, as, we, as we receive an application, we're reviewing it, um, and at that point, it, assigning an investigative team, so there will, will be no slowdown, but I do agree with your assessment that we, we should consider, and I think it is the legislative intent, the, uh, the slots uh, first, which would mean segregating regulations and, and putting an emphasis there. Um, but many of those regulations we need to do for both facilities, right. so it, it would be some fewer regulations. But in speaking to our consultants, there is a way to do that efficiently, effectively. So I, I agree with your assessment that that's, uh, this is a direction we should proceed in. Just to be clear that I, I don't want to give the wrong impression, you know, I'm, I'm confident that our bidders will create quality facilities um, and will be attentive to all the all the uh, design and quality and everything considerations that we care about um, and so I, and I take your point so I think that's an important point other thoughts uh, just to add to that they the investment floor there is 125 million so uh, this is not <laughs> going to be a shoebox good point uh, right um, I, I I had a 
question, uh, Mr. Chairman, for, perhaps for our consultants, and that is about the cannibalization uh, piece. Uh, I, I, yeah. And, and I raised the question for this reason, and I apologize to the, uh, my colleagues because I haven't given the report on, on my two recent trips recently. But we know that, that there's a, a congregation of casinos in Las Vegas and Atlantic City, those places. But uh, when I uh, looked at them in Mississippi, uh, I found a similar kind of thing. You've got a, a pod of casinos in close proximity to each other in Tunica. You've got another pod in Vicksburg. Um, and uh, even within those pods, you come to areas where although there's plenty of land for these things to be spread out, uh, there will be two or three of them cheek by jowl with part of the same complex. Then you drive another half a mile or three quarters of a mile, you come to another group of them uh, together. Um, so I wonder about the, the uh, dynamic and the cannibalization <coughs> effect uh, uh, that uh, seems logical, uh, but doesn't seem to be fit with the facts. Well, with respect to destination resorts, right. uh, they will more likely perform better when they are in very close proximity to other destination resorts, particularly if they're in walking distance, because most people, when they go to, let's say, an Atlantic City or a Las Vegas or a Gulf Coast of, of Mississippi, will visit two to three properties per visit. So you obviously want to be the first, but it doesn't hurt to be the second or third. So they would actually perform better than if you had to get in a car and drive some distance. Uh, that doesn't necessarily address the issue of cannibalization with respect to a slots license versus a destination resort that, that may serve in the same market. It's not necessarily you'd be more likely to cannibalize, perhaps, depending on, on the distance, depending on what's built and what their business models are. Um, but then there's no way to uh, that you'll be able to answer this definitively in, in any instance, but at least if you do cite and issue the slots license first, one added benefit is that it does lend a higher degree of certainty to those uh, yeah. category one I applicants. Forgot, I forgot so, to make that point. So, so they'll know yeah. <clears throat> what the competition is. They'll be able to more precisely and accurately project their own revenues and develop their own business model and determine how much they intend to invest in their properties as a result, uh, which would inure, which would inure to and support the argument of citing the slots license first, as opposed to the other way around where you, where they may not know and they may be running a, a risk of developing a plan, projecting revenues, and then learning at a, at a late date that they will be facing competition, which they may not have anticipated. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, I'm in full agreement with all the points uh, that you make here, Mr. Chairman. I think um, the intent of the legislation to get some of the economic benefits, um, as well as uh, the, the, the intent in, in licensing to the extent possible, because there, there are other moving pieces, as you correctly point out. Uh, to license the slots parlor license first um, would be uh, the way the way to go. So I would I would concur to, with all the arguments made here. Let me let me ask a, a question again in policymaker language, not legal language. But you know, if if the, the objective is to maximize the benefits to the Commonwealth, if we if we knew where the casinos were going to go. Um, and then, particularly, if we could place the slots in a place in a, in a region which is unserved, um, or uh, if there isn't, a, you know, at least a place that's not going to be near a one of the one of the uh, casinos, I think you can you can you can imagine a case that by proactively <coughs> locating the the category one license. In, the, in an unserved, non-competitive part of the state, um, that in the long run, sorry, category two license. Yes, yeah, uh, no, it's the slots. Slots. It's category two. two. Oh, sorry. Okay, category two license. Um, that 
you could you could maximize the benefits in the long run. It would cost you some time, um, but you would you would you would have a, a regional access, proximate you know convenient access for more people. Uh, you would not cannibalize and thus degrade to a limited extent the casino any of the casino licenses. Um, so it seems to me like you know if we were king, you know that would the long-term better way to go financially. Um, we don't know, at least at this moment, we don't know what we have for options. We can't, we, we only can locate uh, a Category 2 license somewhere where there is an applicant. We can't pick the location. Um, but we might know once by January 15th, we will know all the people who are in, and there may be some that are more compatible with the approach that I'm taking. Um, uh, I, I just want to frame the question that that makes the trade-off the clearest. You know, so yes, there's an intent for speed. Yes, uh, there, but there's also an intent for <coughs> maximum job generation, <coughs> maximum economic development, maximum revenue generation. Um, in that trade-off, you know, is it the right way to go? To uh, slots. Uh, I don't think your argument first. is is a strong one, Mr. Chair, and, and I'll tell you why. I think that there are so many other factors. You, you gave a bunch of hypotheticals. So many other factors, other amenities. For example, if you look at the Pennsylvania model, there are several nearby with different themes, different amenities, that are doing very, very well. And there's one that I know of in a region without any other. Um, any other competition, and it's the poorest performer. So I don't think region alone can be this. We cite this here because there's nothing else near that. That is that to me does not. If you look at models around the country, that is not always the best indicator. Just region, and it's citing yeah, it in a place where something else isn't there. So I, I don't think that argument is persuasive for me anyway, as far as um, thinking of holding off for that reason. Yeah, there are many other factors, not the least of which may be local control, by the way, that would be very uh, difficult for us to assess in advance. I, um, I think relative to the question about siting, um, I, I believe at the point of receipt of all uh, requests for applications phase two, um, we could, like Missouri did, uh, run a number of scenarios as to what um, what the presence of casinos uh, um, in different um, uh, places could do to each other, and that could be one uh, of the other of the many criteria in determining the value. It would be only an expected value because it's it's a function of the of the scenarios that that we will be running. But 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 there's a case to be made that we could do an analysis uh, uh, just to determine the value, which then uh, uh, determines inherently jobs and, and economic benefit uh, on a number of permutations, but at that time. So I would, uh, I would say that uh, that's not necessarily a, a, um, something that we are uh, precluded from doing if we bid everything um, at the same time. So we, could, we could always do that analysis right. uh, later on. Yeah, I was really speaking relative to the slots specifically. Like, you know, should, you know, it's just another component. I think Commissioner Zuniga's point, though, illustrates um, uh, something that I, I think we ought to consider, and that is the, a, a functional approach to this, as many others, uh, a functional approach rather than trying to create some kind of a bright line of policy. By that I mean uh, if we get to January 15th and we only have one applicant for a slot spot. Or well, we have two applicants, but they're both in the same general area. That presents one set of circumstances. Um, if we have three or four or five, uh, which would be the ideal, and they're spread around the Commonwealth, then we have uh, then we have that to consider. Uh, insofar as sequencing or not sequencing, it seems to me that's not really the question. The question is, do we have a policy to take region y, region X and then region Y and then region Z. That, that's, or do we not do that? But if we choose not to do that, that doesn't mean that we have to wait and do all three regions, 
potentially, but at least two, A and B, together. If region A is ready much before region B, then there's no reason not to go ahead and issue the region A license right. before we go to region B. That's <coughs> determined function. So, um, and that was what I was trying to say. Okay. This, right. Maybe I missed something. No, no. What you're, yeah. C is, for the moment, C is out of the picture. Right. Um, right. A and B, we would not decide to, to do in, the, in sequence unless the circumstances, so we'll do it just as the circumstances permit, right. but we won't make a conscious decision to do either A or B first right. and the other later. Right. Okay. Then, 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 that, then we, then we <laughs> And, but similarly on the other sequencing question, I'm saying that um, we should decide consciously to move the slots license up to the extent we can. Yeah. And, and with the caveats I've just <coughs> described, I agree with that yeah. for a whole host of reasons. I think it's important to uh, that's the that's the one where it looks like we can get the jobs and the revenue generation going most more quickly, and for a whole host of reasons, consistent with a responsible approach to our investigation and others, I think that would be a good idea. Question, other comments? Yeah, the only other thing I would say is, is uh, you know, just this is for the record, and it's restating what we've said before that this is to our best judgment today. Um, this is, is our best advice to applicants and, and municipalities. Right. Um, a, we will have a regu we will have the regulations writing process, right. and B, we could change our judgments as, right. as circumstances unfold. Um, okay, somebody ready to put that into a motion? Maybe to accept the recommendations as written. If that's, I'll make the motion that we accept the recommendations as written by the chair. Second. Second. Does it look all right? You yeah. want to edit that? No. I, I, no. Okay. Um, any further discussion on questions 8 and 19? All in favor of the motion to accept as written, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. 5 0. 3 down. Um, position paper regarding policy question number four, that would be Commissioners Zuniga and Stebbins. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, let me take a first crack at it. Um, question uh, number four articulates or poses the question uh, of what, if any, additional information to that stipulated in uh, Chapter 23K, Subsection 9, should the Commission require Phase 2 applicants to provide as part of the Phase 2 application? Um, we've received... Um, Excuse me, one sec. When you framed this question, you said attached as a comparison of the sections. I didn't get that. Yes. I, Does that exist it's, anywhere? It's, I don't know. It's not attached. Do you, I'm, I'm we, sorry. Did we not bring no. that? No. We don't have it? We, we, we don't have it. I could explain the background to okay. that. We attempted to do a couple of different oh. spreadsheets. Okay. All yeah. right. I thought, okay. Because yeah. I'm not quite sure what is 9 versus 15 and 18. So maybe you could just. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, part of the, the recommendation uh, here, uh, well, there, there isn't a recommendation per se, largely in part because to, due to the fact that many of the questions that we'll be talking about during this week have a little bit of. Uh, inference here um, as to what ultimately will be a, um, a form of response, I suppose. Um, if I could articulate the, the relevant sections, section 9 would appear to me as, as being the, um, the form of response, and it's at, at the discretion of the Commission because we, we make that uh, determination. Uh, section 15 I would like to term perhaps uh, prerequisites. Uh, the preamble to that section says that uh, the Commission shall not award a license unless the applicant has met a whole host of uh, criteria. Uh, and section 18 uh, is what I would perhaps, perhaps term uh, evaluation criteria because uh, it, it, is pre uh, it has the preamble that the Commission shall issue a statement of findings uh, relative to the criteria that then goes on to, um, to explain. 
Um, what we attempted to do and did not do it in time was to try to have a matrix of um, those, all of those um, sections uh, with the relevant section at the top in, in the columns and then the, the legislative goals um, in the other axis to, to figure out uh, that each uh, intent was always covered. And for the most part, they, they, they all are one way or another. It's also difficult at times to try to follow that framework because uh, legislative intent is covered in, in, in different places uh, in, the, in the form of uh, response and in the evaluation criteria, et cetera. Um, but um, the, the, the point here was, was also perhaps to overlay one, one other section, which is paramount, which is section one which states a number of um, declarations from the general court that um, articulate broad goals. And many of them are further refined in the subsequent sections. Um, and another, uh, which, I, which we articulate here, uh, is uh, relevant to what may be unique, that is not necessarily uh, prescribed um, in a particular subsection. <laughs> But what could make um, what 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 has been clear, a clear documented goal of the legislation in terms of um, uh, creating destination resorts, and <coughs> what questions could form part of of a form of response that could perhaps tease out the um, things like. Uh, um, leveraging the current assets of, uh, of the Commonwealth, the cultural assets, just to pick one. Um, so I have articulated certain of the sections that we could uh, should, should think about framing detailed questions, or um, to a great degree, they could be left uh, in, in the broad form that the legislation um, uh, prescribes. Um, and I can just pick one, uh, promoting local small business and the tourism industry um, could, could end there. What are your plans to do that? Um, as, as, um, or we could decide to take the directive of, um, or the, the approach rather, of um, asking specific questions that tease out uh, uh, um, information, if you will, that could get to that. Um, do you want to expound on that a little bit? Or? Um, sure. As, as Commissioner Zaniga pointed out, this was somewhat of a tough question to tackle because, it, again, we both looked at Section 9 as prescriptive as to what should be in an application. Sections 15 and 18 really detailing more information about criteria for selection. And we were trying to create a spreadsheet which showed Section 9 and whether Section 9 adequately addressed 15 and 18 and whether it actually asked for the right information as prescribed in, uh, in the priorities in the statute in Section 1. Um, in finessing the spreadsheets, we kind of realized our spreadsheets, even though different, would probably come up with the same resolution of the same question. Um, and I think going forward as we do lay out uh, the regulations relative to what should be in the application, I think we're just mindful of don't just look at what's requested in Section 9. Make sure it's compatible with the information in Section 15. Make sure it's compatible with the information in Section 18 um, to the extent that we can. And hopefully it all feeds back to the priorities. But. Um, you know, we wanted to take the opportunity, I think, and you see in the three questions that we suggested, um, uh, somewhat allow a applicant to uh, expound beyond what is a, a statute requirement in terms of give us an idea of how this facility is going to meet the, you know, the goals and objectives of the statute. Uh, Section 18 talks about a high-caliber facility. Well, my definition of high-caliber facility may differ from the next person, so you may want to 
allow some flexibility in the application. Clearly state what is going to make uh, your facility high caliber, you know, truly a destination. Uh, again, to maximize the jobs, maximize the revenue impact that we hope these, these facilities will have. Um, so we, we thought about some broad questions, again, allowing, you know, as we've talked about all along, allowing an applicant to somewhat think outside the box, talk about how their project is going to be different. I think we've seen in, in some similar applications where you've actually had an applicant tell why their facility was going to be better than the facility that might also be competing in the same region. But uh, again, opening the, opening the application to be somewhat more flexible for the applicant, but more to our benefit if in, in the end goal of assessing uh, you know, a license determination. Is 18 the section that, um, well, 18 criteria. is the one that lists a bunch of evaluation criteria, but then it directs the commission to further develop its own criteria. Right? Correct. So right. really what you're talking about here is really pursuant to section 18's yes. direction for the commission to, 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 to broaden the evaluation criteria as it sees fit. Right. Correct. Yeah, okay. Just for the record, could you read me section a little bit of section nine? Is that just te the technical stuff? Uh, no. no, no. It starts with uh, there's detailed information they need to provide the name and and, and, and place of business. But uh, it starts with the commission shall prescribe the form of the application for gaming licenses, and shall require but not limited to a number of things: yeah. uh, the name, uh, uh, right. documentation, okay. um, yeah. so independent it is the audit. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like the technical procurement. Yeah, record. it's like the yeah, form, right, the, okay. the, it, it, the, the response right. form, let's call it. Um, they, they have to describe their entertainment services, the design, the, their conception. And it sounds like your conclusion relative to the question specifically is no. There's no need to add any other requirements to Section 9. Uh, well, there's, there's uh, information that uh, would be needed in terms of... Um, Evaluating criteria in section 18 right, right. and 15. Right. Uh, yes. Uh, the question, the, the the additional questions that we pose here uh, are more in the in the general realm of what would be unique. Right. Um, on the one hand, and another one that we posted here, um, it's in the second paragraph, uh, page two, second to last paragraph is uh, to the extent that we um, wanted to um, identify uh, potential socioeconomic impacts that we will later study as part of the research agenda, we could consider um, asking information of applicants that could serve that, that purpose. But that, that's a little bit in parallel here and uh, maybe difficult to ascertain. Um, and, uh, and lastly, I, I, we suggest, and I don't know how feasible this would be or practical, um, information relative to the process that happens locally. Um, whether uh, we, will, we will clearly have a host uh, uh, and surrounding community document, let's say, and a vote uh, by referendum, you know, in the affirmative. Uh, but any information that we may be able to um, to obtain, and I don't know that, it, that it's necessarily a foregone conclusion that we should, uh, <coughs> relative to that process, whether there were ever community concerns that went unaddressed or compromised, if you will, maybe one one uh, particular data that may be uh, relevant for us, or it may not. That's that's the only other point that I make. Okay. So I think what you're saying is the law is well written, it's comprehensive, and we have to make sure that each section is addressed and, and complements one another. Yes, I, that's, that's well summarized. I, uh... Well, clearly the way you've answered this question feeds right into Commissioner McHugh's next question, which is on 15 and 18. Yes. Right. 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 And I'm not surprised that there was a, a difficulty in creating a spreadsheet because there are really four interrelated sections. There's nine, which is the form of the application, and that's got a lot of, as you've described, uh, technical details, what's your name and address, but it's also got some broader uh, things like studies that you've done and, and the like. Uh, then there's section 15, which are the minimum criteria. You can't get a license 
unless you meet these criteria. Mm -hmm. Some of them are not self-explanatory. Many of them, some of them are. Then there's Section 18, uh, which, as you said, uh, 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 contains things the Commission has to evaluate when considering the application. And then there's Section 21, which is the license conditions. Right. And, and not all of those match up exactly in the same way. So the trick is to cover uh, through regulations, the statutory waterfront, while at the same time not being so uh, prescriptive that one undermines the creativity that we anticipate and hope everybody will bring to this process. I mean, that's really what, what we're trying to do. And, and we'll see some changes to nine because some of the questions we've already knocked out in the RFA one. That's correct. Process. We've already asked certain question, questions one through subsection one, one through eight on RFA phase one. Yeah, well, they're, yeah, they're, they're part of the same it's application. Part of yeah. right. um, so I don't, do we need, I don't know that we really need to, to do anything to this. Okay. Um, is there a need to take any specific action other than to follow this right up with 15 and 18, which is coming next? Um, I, I don't think there is. I think uh, the question as posted or as posed was one of are we missing anything right. uh, to your to Commissioner um, um, at the review that we have done uh, and subject to a number of questions that we still have to answer between now and the end of, le uh, of this week but, but later, um, it wouldn't appear to me that right. there's, there's, okay. a, there's a big uh, so. Right. Um, all those relevant sections will be addressed one way or another in the form of regulation and form of response. But uh, I, I don't think there's major things. I like the three the three evaluative criteria you've raised, but I think they go right to the next question too. All right, so we just move on. Um, <coughs> Commissioner McHugh, question five. So I've divided question five into two parts. Um, question five uh, <coughs> says, what if any criteria in addition to those listed in 23K sections 15 and 18 should the Commission use in the RFA2 licensing determination in order to ensure that the license awarded will provide the highest and best value to the Commonwealth in the region in which the gaming establishment is located? And uh, part two of that, uh, uh, which also ties into another question that's going to be dealt with later. How should any criteria in addition to those listed in 23K, 15, and 18 be weighed, ranked, or scored? So there's a scoring question and a content question. And um, insofar as um, the content question is concerned, um, uh, we had a number of uh, comments from various respondents. Uh, the Mass Audubon Society said that there should be some contents to Section 18, that's the evaluation section, uh, that focused on green, uh, uh, building green. Um, uh, uh, Messrs. Bernstein, Fisher, and Levin uh, weighed in and uh, talked about uh, the impact on recreational and other values of the site to nearby communities, uh, i.e., you shouldn't, uh, we should think about putting a casino on top of a national monument. Uh, uh, that wouldn't, that wouldn't in, in uh, Mr. Bernstein's, uh, in, in uh, uh, Correspondent Bernstein's view, be a good idea, that kind of thing. Um, uh, community impact, uh, should, we should take into account. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Transportation impacts uh, should be something we take into account. Um, the uh, Metropolitan Area Planning Commission has said that we should add conditions to both 15 and 18 that focused on transportation impacts. That was their primary uh, concern. Uh, MGM uh, suggested that the applicant's track record elsewhere uh, was something that we should consider in uh, evaluating uh, the applications that we receive. What, what have they done elsewhere? What kinds of facilities? What kinds of success have they had? Uh, and uh, uh, Shevsky and Froelich, on behalf of Springfield, said everything's crystal clear. You shouldn't have anything. Uh, uh, it's all right there. Uh, insofar as Section 15 is concerned, that's the minimum criteria. We may 
uh, want to issue clarifying regulations for ambiguous parts of that. Some of the terms are broad, but basically that is a, unless you meet these criteria, you can't get a license. Um, I, I don't think uh, we can add uh, uh, to that uh, in, in terms of a statutory authority. And even if we could, I'm not sure that's something we should do. I think it's something we should not do, let me put it affirmatively, because those are go-no-go -go criteria, and I don't think we should uh, add to the go-no-go -go criteria that the legislature has already uh, determined. Insofar as Section 18 is concerned, the evaluation uh, criteria, um, <coughs> I think um, we, can, we certainly can add to those criteria, and we should think about we should think about doing that. Uh, many of those criteria, as I said in the memorandum, though, are so broad uh, that one is going to have to uh, think of, of what we're really trying to uh, achieve uh, in the evaluation process uh, in interpreting and applying those criteria. For example, Section 1813 requires the Commission to consider how the, applica how the applicant proposes to offer the highest and best value to create a secure and robust gaming market in the region and the Commonwealth. One can simply ask that question and say, tell us how you propose to do it, and I think we should do that. On the other hand, it would be helpful if we have some ideas uh, to put those, for things that we'll be looking for, to lay those ideas out and say, these are things that we'll be looking uh, for in particular in an application. They're not determinative. The failure to meet one of these qualifications uh, or the failure to deliver this thing does not necessarily mean you won't get the application, but it's something we'll be interested in hearing you talk about. Um, likewise, um, uh, Section 1811 requires an applicant to demonstrate how it proposes to maximize revenues received by the Commonwealth. Uh, there, too, we could be uh, talking about things that we'll be interested in hearing them discuss um, at some point in the application process. Uh, without uh, prescribing something that they have to discuss uh, or, or a value that they have to achieve in order to achieve uh, and obtain a license. Um, it seemed to me, and this, this comes into play in the, in the next section about the evaluation, it seems to me that it would be helpful if we have ideas along those front, and I think we should have ideas along that front, uh, to prescribe what they are, uh, to lay them out. Uh, and, and then um, uh, draft regulations that embody them. I didn't uh, uh, start down that path now for laying out uh, 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 particularly Section 18 criteria, or Section 18 uh, values uh, that we'd be looking for, because I wanted to see whether the Commission would agree with that approach uh, before doing it. Uh, but it seems to me that we could uh, come up with a series of, of, uh, of, uh, of values, be they economic or other, uh, and lay them out and uh, uh, in fairly short order if that's what we decided to do. Alternatively, we could simply uh, say that uh, these uh, uh, statutory criteria speak for themselves. They're very broad, so they speak uh, uh, about a broad range of things that uh, that uh, applicants uh, can propose uh, and then uh, see what the applications turn up. I think that would be unfair in some ways, both to the public and to the applicants, uh, because it's so broad uh, that the Commission could uh, decide um, that something was embodied in one of these broad statutory terms that uh, nobody really thought about and they would be blindsided. So the question really is, how do we articulate uh, the uh, fashion in which we are going to exercise our undoubtedly broad discretion in a way that helps us and the public and the applicants understand our thinking, but at the same time doesn't stifle the creativity we hope will be brought to the process. And uh, that is the kind of broad thematic way I've chosen to make a recommendation as to an answer to this question. As I say, it ties into the next question um, uh, when we get to the evaluation criteria. But, so I use that as a starting point. 
Well, I, I would be uh, in favor of being prescriptive in, ter in terms of the criteria. Um, sort of when, whenever anybody goes to take an exam and you like to figure out just how much uh, this, this perhaps gets to the second uh, part of the question. Um, what's the relative weight? What matters, um, you know, between my written response and my and my math section? Just to, to stay with the, with the exam analogy, um, and I I I, I think uh, um, that's an important policy statement um, that that uh, I believe that has the tendency of leveling the playing field, if nothing else, the understanding. Um, of the of the applicants, so I, I would be in favor in trying to uh, prescribe that criteria, with the understanding that there there is quite a bit that that is qualitative in nature, and and, and, and we'll have to make uh, qualitative determinations. Um, but uh, to uh, to allow applicants um, the ability to say we thought we met uh, uh, the intention and responded, and we were responsive, and therefore you know. We have, we have a shot and a fair shot. Uh, so I would, I would even go uh, to the second part of the, of the question. Well, let's, uh, get, let's, let's get to that in a second. Okay. Unless, yeah, I think. Um, so on the first part, you're suggesting that we should issue some kind of clarifying either regulations or advisories, I guess either or both, to help um, flesh out the criteria that we will use under the prescribed criteria, particularly in Section 18, it sounds like. Um, and I mean, my reaction to that is I'd be interested in seeing it. I mean, I'd, it's hard for me to quite figure out. You know, I, I kind of lean towards leaving them vague, but I'd be very much open to taking a shot at some of them and seeing how, see if we think we can, we can make the process a better process by that clarifying. Um, but there's a second part of 18, which goes to the three questions that Commissioners Stebbins and Zuniga raised, which is, what additional criteria will we bring to the table? And how do we articulate those criteria? And are you, are you speaking to that as well, or have you spoken to that? Okay. No, I am. Uh, section 18 uh, is a, uh, unlike Section 15, um, uh, does not, uh, unlike Section 15, as I'm recommending, that, uh, uh, allows us certainly to add additional criteria. When you read that in the context of uh, Section uh, 5A3, which broadly empowers the Commission to prescribe criteria for evaluation of the application for a gaming license, that's what Section 5A3 allows us to do. So we've got Section 18, which sets things we must consider, Section 5A3 allows us to prescribe more things. I guess my point is that it's not entirely clear that you have to prescribe additional things because some of those categories are so broad that almost yeah. anything you could think of right. fits within them. True. But to the extent we need to go beyond it, we have the power to do it. And my recommendation is that we do it, that we, that we lay out criteria. Um, and uh, uh, for at least things that we are looking to have the uh, applicant address, things that are important to us, uh, and we'll get to the waiting thing in a, in a, in a second, because that's a separate uh, piece of this. But I, but I go back to uh, one of the, one of the um, forums that we uh, uh, heard and held early on uh, when we heard from uh, when we heard from Jeffrey Simon, that was the, the forum we had in, um, in Holyoke, I believe, and who has, who has done a lot of these uh, large planning processes from the standpoint of the developer. And his um, uh, 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 articulation, his careful articulation of the desirability uh, uh, for developers of knowing what the permit granting authority, which in the last analysis is us, are going to be looking for. Not the exclusive things, but, but things that are of interest and importance to the, to the permit granting authority. And um, it seems to me that's essential um, uh, to uh, a sound development. It's essential for the public to understand. It's essential for people to comment on 
in terms of developing these uh, criteria. Uh, but some of these categories are so broad that, as I say, it would be unfair, I think, to the public and to the applicant not to try and clarify them because we could think of things during the evaluation process that nobody else had addressed, thought of, or considered as being part of what it was that was there. To simply encapsulate, you're suggesting looking at all the criteria set aside in 18, but I would also suggest if we take what's in 18 and see how it matches up back to section one. Oh, I don't, I, I, I fully agree with that. Okay, and just see what criteria or what measurements might be missing that we don't feel are captured well. Yes, but I, but I would, I would, I would not say, uh, I would not leave it as uh, uh, comply with one, 18, 19, and I, right. I, I would try to define this more precisely as to, as to what we think, uh, as to what we're looking for when we're, when we're, when we're uh, trying to find out what offers the highest and best value to the secure and robust gaming market in the region. Right. Is that, is that, is that jobs? Is that a balance sheet? Is that um, uh, a really attractive marketing package? Uh, is that uh, combinations with others? Uh, at least, what, what are your ideas as to how you're going to do this? And then other, you know, so so that uh, so that we have a, a mechanism for comparing apples to apples, and at the same time allowing uh, applicants to be creative with things that perhaps others didn't think about. As long, as long as we, as you, you're describing a really good line, and I, if, if, if we want to give everybody in the, in the game as clear an articulation of what we will be using as criteria as we can, but also we want to encourage people to be innovative and creative, and so if we get the song, we don't want to run the risk of setting out some criteria that we then can't go beyond, you know, and no. that's one thing that I wrestle with, you know, how right. do we give everybody a heads up when we don't know for sure all the things right. we're going to think about, and right. if we purport to have said these are all the things we're going to think about, then we can't, or we run the risk of prescribing our ability to come up with another criteria later on. So that we have to draft it carefully, but um, but I, I agree. Um, I'd, I'd welcome hearing yeah, from our I agree. consultants. <coughs> they, they, the section ten, which, which uh, uh, of the of the strategic plan, talks about the the, the um, evaluation scheme, and, and uh, I would I, I commend their thought, thinking on I, that. And yeah, I'm going you. to refer to it when we get to the next question. But as to the prescribing piece, I'd welcome hearing from them about how to walk that line. I used to have a couple of thoughts. I I would agree uh, with with Commissioner McHugh in the sense that. The breadth of the criteria that are there now are really not instructive in a, in a large sense to the applicants in terms of what is really important to you. Uh, and to the extent that the Commission can, uh, as a body, uh, determine what you really are looking for. What do you want this casino to be like? What do you want it to look like? What do you, and, and be able to articulate in some way some kind of the, some of that kind of standard would be very instructive and very helpful to any applicant and also provide you with the information you would need to make a, an informed decision. Um, in terms of some examples possibly of what is not present in Section 18 that might be something that could be further articulated or, for example, although it cuts around the edges of this, there's no real request for a business plan or a real kind of a business philosophy. Is this going to be a Casino that could otherwise, you know, is in the industry team, the grind joint. Is this? Are you going after high-level players? Are you going after? Are you not going to emphasize high-level play? Are you going to? Uh, are you going to emphasize your your gaming as opposed to your non-gaming amenities? Are you going to emphasize your non-gaming amenities? Um, uh, what is what is the what is the operation of this casino going to look like when it's finally up up and going? So you can almost get a mental picture of what it is that is anticipated uh, when you're evaluating the, uh, the, the application. So those are just a couple of thoughts right. I'm, I'm sitting here. Yeah, uh, I would add that I'm going to make some comments that I think are very supportive of what Commissioner McHugh and Commissioner Stebbin said with respect to encouraging creativity and flexibility in the process. In any gaming statute, 
anywhere, there's going to be inherent conflicts between some of the goals. Uh, it's almost unavoidable. And the, the most obvious would be, do you want to maximize revenue and capital investment? Do you want to protect local businesses? They, on paper, can be largely incompatible. Commissioner McHugh, you talked earlier about the experience in New Orleans. And uh, that was an example early on of, I think, a, a misguided statute in the sense that they wanted a, an operator to come in and not, and, and specifically not be able to build hotel rooms and restaurants and so forth. Uh, so obviously they ran into problems and obviously they did not maximize uh, capital investment as a result. And there was no creativity in the process. There was very strict guidelines that they had to adhere to. So um, w with that being said, I think that uh, it's going to be very difficult to specifically quantify and specifically enumerate all of the uh, criteria as to uh, the priorities. But have, uh, be that as it may, there are some that clearly rise to the top. Uh, chief among them would be the uh, generation of revenue. And I, and I think, and I would uh, respectfully suggest that revenue be looked at in its broadest possible sense and not strictly in terms of the gaming revenue to be generated on site, or certainly not in terms of the value of what may be placed on the, uh, on the license fee, but just in its broadest sense in terms of employment, in terms of uh, ancillary businesses and the indirect and induced impact of what you're planning to do. What are your plans with respect to tourism generation? And how does that translate into revenue, again, in its broadest possible sense? But putting the burden on the applicants, which arguably is, is where the statute intended, putting the burden on the applicants to be as creative as possible in terms of coming up with a plan that is as comprehensive as they can uh, muster in terms of, of agreements with local businesses, agreements with employment and training centers in, in, within their respective regions, and putting the burden on them, and then having all of that translate, and may, having them, again, with the burden on them to demonstrate as to how that would translate into overall revenue maximization. How do you deal with uh, the, the uh, question or the concern, legitimate, it's always concern the chairman Crosby raised about the, the fact that you articulate a, a variety of criteria in which you're interested. And then you get into the um, process. And you, by virtue of the applications you're receiving, the fact that the learning curve is increased, the other uh, things that uh, change in the, in the economy or otherwise, you uh, begin to think about some criterion that you never mentioned before, and that begins to assume an importance that probably nobody thought about when this process started. Hopefully the process won't go on that long, but it'll be a complete surprise, but but things change. How do you how do you deal with that kind of thing? I'll start first. I think there are two ways to deal. One one would be that you're and as Mike has said, even though you might be being more specific than, than the statute is, you're not being so specific that you're, you, it can be interpreted as if you're excluding other factors. I mean, the, even the, the guidance that you're providing would still be general enough to include a number of other things. Second, though, and there are always, as you say, unanticipated uh, issues that might arise, and there's nothing from preventing you to, from supplementing uh, your request for information <coughs> to say at a later time, uh, this additional question has arisen. Uh, we'd like your view on it. Uh, and have all the applicants uh, submit uh, some response to that. The regulatory scheme can uh, simply provide for that. Right. Things we, yeah. and, and, and I suppose there's always the questions that could be framed in, uh, as, as Mike suggests, other. Uh, if, if we're talking about some criteria and we're defining revenue as broad as possible, but, uh, but, but also solicit your um, right. your views and ideas from right. applicants right. as to... And remember, the, these, these applications, both phase one and phase two, are not the be-all, end-all of the inquiry. Uh, it really is the start of the inquiry. They'll be submitting their phase two applications, but you'll be meeting, there'll be meetings held and discussions held uh, and evaluations made 
uh, that will be in addition to, and you'll, they'll be supplying information to you supplemental to that application form. It won't be the only material you'll be evaluating. But yeah, I'm really, th I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I I'm really thinking about the evaluation piece. Uh, and uh, I think you've answered the question, but you get into, you, you get four applications and somebody says something that nobody else has thought about. I mean, it's just a different kind of idea. And uh, it isn't listed in the kinds of things you're thinking about uh, using as an evaluation criteria. At that point, I take, but it's really interesting. At that point, I take it you go back and say, hey, sure. how, how, what are, you, what are all of you going to do about X? Right. Right. Uh, it, he asked the question perfectly. I mean, you could see yourself, instead of this commission maybe agonizing over all of these criteria and trying to think of our own benchmarks or our own information that we'd be looking for, leave this as, I don't want to say too general, but leave this as general as possible and to the point of if we get something from an applicant that, you know, wow, really defines high number of quality jobs. Well, my definition is probably different than his and everybody else's. But setting aside some time to go back to the other three or four applicants in a certain region and say, how do you plan to address this? Well, I'll just say that uh, I, mean, I could conceive of a situation in which two applications in the same region, or arguably perhaps even in the same community, one may be uh, more creative than the other in part because it's, ha it's in a specific location where there are specific attributes related to that application that the others simply cannot match or not in a position to address. And the maximum flexibility in being able to allow applications to, to include such factors is important. I was, yeah, but, um, I'm sorry, I was, I was thinking uh, Mr. Chair, about Singapore and how they clearly articulated a vision for what they wanted. And they talked about the beauty of people coming from around the world because it was aesthetically pleasing. Um, amenities, gaming was a small part of what they envisioned. And all of the other amenities that would draw people that were not typical to the region. And, and so they left it open-ended, but they clearly articulated a vision and who best could fit that vision. Um, and they had different evaluation teams evaluating portions of it. And I thought it was interesting, and um, it laid out what they were looking for, but, but left it broad enough that. Um, yeah. and, and that was part of the benefit of Singapore. They had, like you have in some of these regions, competitive licenses where, where different companies were competing for the same license, which essentially raised the bar of, of what they got. And, in the case of Marina Bay Sands, as, as you saw, you know, they thought outside the box, they did something totally different, and, and they were rewarded for that uh, through the selection criteria. So the fact, the competition there, at least from our experience, drove uh, the process to get better quality designs, better quality applicants. Those companies that just um, tried to reproduce a Las Vegas casino while they might have been suitable, they didn't make it through the process. Right. Ironically, I'm sure this is, well, I just, ironically, I was sitting here thinking the exact same thing, that the, the, what's in Singapore is referred to, as you all know, is not referred to as casinos, it's referred to as integrated resorts, and they got much more money invested in amenities, whether it's hotels, art museums, aquariums, convention centers, MGM Universal theme parks, um, now, those were much more valuable licenses. Those were $6 billion deals. Um, but is there anybody in, in the U.S. that's done a particularly good job of inviting, of creating a document that invites and rewards, you know, stuff beyond the casino, the amenities, the leveraging, the extra stuff? Is there anybody who's done a particularly good job as that, like Singapore did in spades? Well, I think you're going to be, I mean, Mike can talk to that, but that hasn't, the same um, approach hasn't been utilized in, in other American jurisdictions yet, but there I think is an increasing recognition that while the gaming may drive these resorts, uh, the non-gaming and, and uh, amenities are really the wave of the future. Well, it depends on where you are. I, I don't want to, yes. there, there's specific examples in both cases. Uh, Revel, for example, in New Jersey, uh, 
uh, envisioned itself as the new wave of non-gaming, uh, emphasizing uh, you know the restaurants and the clubs and the pools and uh, I've got about 16 pools. I don't know what they've got there, but uh, it, it, so far it hasn't worked. So uh, there's there are different environments and there are different philosophies for each environment. That's make that's what makes it so hard for you as a commission to try to, and I, I'm sure you're not intending to uh, superimpose any more specific kind. Say this is what we want: a more non a more non gaming amenity focused, uh, you know, facility. When you, it's really the applicant's job to evaluate what they think is necessary, and yours to evaluate their evaluation. Um, the other part of the creativity, as Fred points out, and again, I, I'm sure you didn't mean this in terms of the of someone coming up with a with a good idea after you've started the evaluation. You don't want to stifle creativity that way. And, and if one applicant comes up with a real good idea for something, then go to all the other applicants and say, "Hey, this applicant A just is proposing this. Can you do that too?" Uh, that really isn't, you know, the, the function of the competitive process. So, no, I, I wasn't thinking about yeah. that. I was thinking about some. Uh, some uh, some issue, some some uh, generic issue that was addressed in one application that wasn't addressed in another. Not a not a not a uh, not an innovative way of marketing the product, but some some issue that uh, that somehow was all had, we had been overlooked in the process. And Just one, one I was issue. thinking. I, I'll tell you specifically. I was thinking about uh, again that. Go back to that grand jury report, uh, where, where um, they had not prescribed in the um, application process or in the criteria they said they were going to use for evaluation the um, possibility that a uh, an applicant was going to use uh, its license in Pennsylvania to drive customers into. Uh, uh, New Jersey, I think it was. Well, that, that's, uh, and 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 then they used that as a criterion without giving anybody any notice that they were going to do that. Well, as a great example, and we were intimately involved in that. Right. We both at that time worked for one of the applicants, and it was the the commission in that case did make or made it clear at the end of the process that its licensing decisions were going to be guided in in no small measure. By whether or not they had a uh, a property, or, or from New Jersey, right. and it was not one of the measurable criteria. It, it was it was clearly not uh, part of the process, and right. and uh, we we took great pains to point that out to you that right. uh, as much as possible that applicants should know to whatever extent they can be really what they're going to be right. evaluated right. on. Right. But in kind of answer to your point also. Uh, Mr. Chairman, is that in the U.S. part of the, there's been where there has been a competitive bidding process, it has largely been in jurisdictions where there's a very high tax rate of 50 percent plus in certain instances, and and that Pennsylvania was being a good example. And th those don't lend themselves to right. either creativity or anything like what you would see in Singapore. Right. But you're set, you're, is that by way of saying that, that at our tax rate and our environment, you think our aspiration to that is reasonable? Yeah, I, I think in the, in the current uh, investment climate in the gaming industry, that the tax rate in Massachusetts is, is generally viewed as attractive and sufficiently attractive that you can encourage that level, not to a Singapore level, but, but you can encourage some significant creativity among applications. Um, before we carry on on this, I need to take a quick break. So let's come back and hopefully we can finish up Commissioner uh, McHugh's two questions uh, before we break for lunch. Okay, let's um, let's reconvene. Thank you. Um, so Commissioner McHugh, I think we I think we have a lot of useful conversation. I think it seems like there is a consensus that we would like to take a shot at, at what you refer to as clarifying regulations or at least clarifying advisories um, where we are thinking about additional criteria pursuant to 18 it sounds like there's a consensus that we would like to articulate those as you have for example uh, relative to question four um, 
how would you see us proceeding at this I, point? I, I don't think we need a vote at this point, Mr. Chairman, if we have a, a consensus that we ought to proceed this way. But I would like us to, uh, uh, within a, set a target for a, for a relatively short period of time uh, in which we lay out uh, the criteria that we are uh, contemplating using in the evaluation process. Come up with a list, uh, talk about it, get some feedback on it, and then use it as a basis for regulations. I, and I think we could, we've got good models around, uh, I'll get to that, some of that in the next piece. Uh, I think we could do that very um, uh, expeditiously within the next uh, four to six weeks and um, uh, have something by the end of that that, that uh, uh, that uh, we considered useful and helpful in, and, and still not creativity, creativity stifling. So, I, and I propose to take a crack at coming up with a first list and circulating it and having people add on and then talking about it seriatim if necessary until we, until we get it done and say now we're ready for public comment. Uh, and, uh, yeah. It may not be a long list, yeah, but I, I, I know. Agree. I think this, this conversation is an example of why the host community agreements would be well advised not to be ex not to be completed early on. We've, 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 we've had a conversation, for example, about the, the role of amenities here, which is not a conversation we've ever had before, um, and clearly is going to take us someplace relative to what we're looking for in our in the proposals. Um, so I I I'm agree with you. I, I think the uh, commission uh, gleefully accepts your offer, and. Um, Let's proceed that way. Okay. You take us take a take a stab at a, at okay. a draft. Okay. This will okay. be a collaborative. Okay. Additive. Then let's go back to part two of question five. Yeah. So part two is where the where part one really where, where the rubber part one meets the road because the question becomes now we've got the criteria, what do we do about evaluating um, and. Um, uh, there are a number of um, uh, comments um, uh, from our correspondents. The Metropolitan Area Planning uh, Commission uh, uh, said that we ought to have a, co a comprehensive, fair, transparent uh, uh, evaluation system based on best practices elsewhere. MGM uh, said a scoring system, again, should take account of past experience and, uh, with other facilities that were built at the same cost and they're the, by the same applicant. <coughs> Springfield uh, says we shouldn't use a scoring system but should consider the applications as a whole. Sterling Suffolk uh, said that the decision should be based, uh, made on the basis of the Commission's informed exercise of judgment and discretion. Uh, one can't disagree with that. The question is how do we uh, channel our discretion so that people have an idea of how we're going to exercise it. Um, absolute uh, discretion unchanneled and unexplained has at least the tinge of arbitrariness. Uh, and in my view, it's impossible uh, for us to make a reasoned decision in a, in a way that serves public policy, given these broad criteria, without attempting to do it. There basically are two <coughs> models that I thought about. Um, uh, and uh, one is embodied in the Missouri uh, approach, uh, which basically identified six, uh, four, I think it was, four to six economic criteria. Actually, there are three. Uh, four to six economic criteria. And then, uh, because that was a competitive process, three applicants were a single license. Then it graded those, um, resp the responses of the applicants is good, better, best, and, or some uh, verbally in that fashion, and then looked at who uh, emerged at the top. And it was pretty clear in that situation that one applicant was the best all the way through. So there was no, it wasn't close. Uh, so that's one way to proceed. Uh, the other way, and uh, the presentation I thought was was terrific was done by the Pittsburgh Planning Department, City of Pittsburgh Planning Department. Now I should add as a caveat that 
their recommendations, although the study was great, their recommendations weren't followed, and um, disaster ensued. But uh, <laughs> that doesn't detract from the thoroughness with which they uh, approached the study. And they uh, basically took uh, six factors uh, that dealt with uh, a whole variety of things, location, economics, aesthetics, uh, tourism, a whole bunch of uh, six, six categories, and then subcategories in each of those that they weighted in a different way. And then, uh, because they had a number of people who were voting uh, 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 in the planning department, they um, uh, had a number of points. It was a, it was a hugely elaborate system. Uh, that created weighted average votes times the weight to be given to the criterion, and they ultimately came up with a score at the end that had uh, a variety of numbers on it. And the applicants were ranked, the three applicants again, were ranked according to those numbers. And there turned out to be a wide disparity uh, between the three applicants that showed up. And um, uh, I'm not sure good, better, best wouldn't have produced the same result. In fact, I think it would have. Uh, but in any event, that's the way they approached. The, the utility of that approach was not so much, it seemed to me, the scoring system, but the rigor with which they considered uh, the various criteria. Um, uh, it seems to me that um, we ought to think about um, some kind of, and then there is also, as the consultants uh, thoughtfully laid out in um, section 10, pages 83 to 85 of uh, the uh, strategic plan, uh, the Kansas Lottery Gaming Facility Review Board <coughs> model, in which they did um, something um, uh, similar um, by listing the criteria, creating a matrix, and then using a ranking system uh, to uh, uh, allow them to see uh, uh, the contestants side by side and compare apples to apples. Um, uh, so they did, uh, they did it uh, that way. It seems to me that, that without, um, without, um, without uh, uh, tying our hands to a single uh, approach uh, that in an area where there's competition, it, uh, it would be preferable to have some kind of a verbal assessment rather than a numerical ranking. I, I'm, I'm concerned that numerical rankings tend to give the illusion of certainty to what's really a subjective process. You just you assign a number uh, that really is as subjective as, as any phrase you could use, and, and uh, it, may, it may not be as helpful, therefore. So I, I would, uh, in a competitive area perhaps, uh, recommend a verbal process, a, a fairly rigorous listing of the things that we were looking for, plus allowing for the creativity and, and ingenuity of the applicant, uh, and then in a competitive process, rank them good, uh, better, or best. Um, in an area where we have no competition, uh, simply um, go through the same criterion setting process and uh, simply uh, uh, assign some kind of a verbal, uh, this, is, uh, this is great, this is good, this is not so good, and use that as a guide uh, to deciding, A, whether we issue a license at all, and B, if there are some not so good or terrible uh, uh, responses. Uh, think about including some uh, remediation in the license conditions once the license is issued. Or going back and negotiating. Or going back and negotiating. Yeah. <coughs> but but that we that we that we proceed in that fashion with a combination of a of a rigorous uh, listing, non-exclusive listing of the things we're going to be interested in, and then uh, some. Uh, some verbal assessment rather than a numerical assessment of, of our impressions. I have one, uh, one general comment. Um, 
I, I would agree, of course, with, with the notion of, of, of having a, a scoring. And, uh, you know, uh, whether we're uh, talking about uh, the nuances behind uh, a number and a verbal assessment, uh, that's, that's, if you will, what I, what I want to comment on. Um, perhaps is my mathematical background, but uh, I would even assign uh, a, a number to a good, better, and, 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 and best um, uh, ranking either a 1, 2, or 3, or a, a 0, 5, and 10, if the scale is 10. Um, so I, um, I, I think an issue here is the relative importance between one criteria and another. Yeah. We would not want to be in a position where, let's just say, we have three criteria and, up, and three applicants. And one applicant is good in criteria number, criteria, criterium number one, uh, better in criterium number two, and best in criterium number three, and, and the others are uh, at the same <laughs> place but in different criteriums. Uh, so um, I would want to uh, uh, encourage ourselves, and, and with the help of, help of our consultants and other jurisdictions, like the Missouri or like the Pittsburgh uh, experience, to, to think about relative weight. Um, uh, it's, it's, it occurs to me that you know economic benefits, everybody would agree, um, are chief among them. Uh, but there is, uh, like the statute says, there is not just um, uh, maximizing the good, but also minimizing the bad, and and how we um, weigh those those um, those things against each other is going to be, um, I think, important for us to for us to articulate. I, I, I agree uh, fully that we ought to wait that they're not all equal weight. But I also am really um, concerned about the illusion of certainty that goes with numbers. And I'm, I'm, I'm equally concerned about the possibility that you get a situation in which you've got uh, an applicant, particularly in a competitive area, in a non competitive area, you've got maybe a pass fail system. Uh, but in a competitive area, we have one uh, applicant gets an 89 and the other applicant gets an 88. And we make a decision based on that, or uh, we uh, uh, make a decision that we're going to go with the 88 and have the explaining to do about why we didn't go with the 89. I, I, that, that's the concern that ultimately uh, uh, worries me about uh, a purely numerical score. And, 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 like to stay away from that. and I believe the, 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 the way to address that is to be as, as candid and as honest as, as we can relative to really comparing uh, one against another. Uh, not get everybody, you know, good when there's a clear difference. Uh, or, or rather, not give uh, two applicants an excellent if clearly one is better than the other in a particular criteria. Um, and, and thus, um, uh, we could, in, 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 in the scenario that you pose, we could, by virtue of the different criterion, criteria, end up in a very similarly or very tight com uh, uh, result. Uh, but um, I, I think there's ways to address that by, by virtue of deliberation among, um, among well, ourselves. Well, I'd, like I'd like to, if we could, Mr. Chairman, hear sure. from our consultants as to, as to any thoughts they have about? My first thought is that I certainly don't envy you having to make these decisions because you're, you're dealing with issues that are going to, by, by definition, defy um, the, uh, the rankings. And it, it strikes me that um, while I, I hadn't thought of it in those terms, it makes a lot of sense to to prioritize the criteria so that uh, I'm just going to pick two two examples that revenue generation and being green are not are not going to be of, of equal merit. Right. Um, Depending on who you talk to. Exactly, um, but uh, the answer is going to come down to essentially, and uh, and we, there are states that have done this, or jurisdictions that have done this better than others, and some of them have not done it well. But really, what it comes down to is the ability to effectively and fully articulate the criteria on which this particular application was, was developed. I, I think it's safe to say that in Pennsylvania, for example, they did not 
the regulators did not meet that threshold, uh, that they did not adequately, to the, to the extent of, of all parties involved, fully and clearly articulate the criteria on which their licensing decisions were based. That may be an elusive goal in itself. You may never be able to, to fully satisfy them all, but I think that's what it, really what it's going to, going to come down to is the ability to be, be it qualitative or quantitative or some combination thereof to be able to fully articulate uh, the basis for that decision. So would you, would you, putting, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I just, no. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Mike. Sorry. Um, would you, putting your two sections together, would you, when I'm talking about doing, clarifying regs, clarifying criteria for the evaluation criteria in the, in the law, as well as whatever criteria else we may come up with, um, would you then talk about, in effect, sort of collapsing those back into just a handful, like you said, like Pittsburgh had six or whatever? I and thought, then, and I, then I, having I thought, some kind of, so how would how would you do this now? I, 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 my my the, the the approach that I would take, and and this, uh, this is uh, subject to change. But the approach that I would take was would be to try to take the Pittsburgh type approach, which has six categories with a, a number of subcategories, and um, and assign some weight to each of those. This, we're, we consider this very important, we consider this important, we consider this desirable, say. And list all of the criteria. And um, then um, uh, use that as the basis for uh, carrying out the evaluation. Whether we assign a number to each of those, and I would not be um, viscerally inclined to do that, or whether we assign some verbal score really depends on how you could get, uh, uh, what the results you could get from both from both uh, approaches, numerical and non-numerical. And I think depending on the, on the, um, on whether you're dealing with a competitive uh, 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 region or one in which non-competitive, I think you'd be able to come up with a a verbal assessment of each of the criteria that would would uh, help you uh, guide the outcome. And at least I'd like to try that. I don't think it's going to be that difficult uh, to list the criteria that we're interested in hearing about. I just don't think it's going to be that hard. That part is going to be that hard. I don't think it's going to be that hard in the last analysis to assign a weight. How important do we think these things are? Uh, whether we use a, a verbal or a numerical criteria may be a little bit more difficult, and how, but but I don't think that's uh, 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 an uh, insuperable uh, would pose any insuperable obstacles. So that's the, that's the vision, Mr. Chairman, that I right. have, the way it would work. Um, so and, and just to put a final point on, you'd have to, which Pittsburgh didn't do, you'd have to leave some space for ingenuity and. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, so we don't have to we don't have to button this up for a while. I mean, the, but um, so we really are talking about doing the first stage first. We're now going to expand the criteria first, and then we're going to collapse them back up into the Pittsburgh-like six with sub criteria, and then um, think about how we would weight those. That's sort of the sequence of activities. Well, I think we start with, I, I think the first two parts of that are simultaneous. I mean, I think you have categories and, so, and subparts okay. of the category. Okay, yeah, and, and, fine, and, okay, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. I actually um, think it might be important, though, that we move this process along, <clears throat> because I think the applicants would want to no know question. as soon as possible how we're scoring, why, what yeah. we value. Yeah, and I agree, I just meant, yes, I, I agree with that. The details of whether we're going to use verbal or right. Letters, you know, but but the, the fundamental criteria and the weighting of those criteria is very important. And I right. think in in Commissioner McHugh's same four to six week time frame, right. meaning by the end of January, right. um, so we can has been, have been as clear and articulate as we can about right. those criteria and their weighting, which we now understand, right. as we now understand them. Right? Okay. Um, do has, yeah, I, I I don't want to uh, belabor the point, but uh, I. I um, 
I, I, I think uh, let's 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 see what happens with within the next uh, as we start putting together the form of response and the criteria. But I um, I don't see any other way but but an assignment of points. However, whether and we may be talking about the same thing uh, when everything is said and done. But um, in order to really differentiate what and I'm gonna I'm thinking of the following. Uh, economic benefits could even be in the form of short term and long term, um, and uh, you know, in, in, in different proposals, uh, we, we started thinking a little bit about readiness uh, to proceed uh, as perhaps uh, a, a real factor into when when the when the Commonwealth and there and therefore everyone else, uh, the, the, the jobs are created and the, and the revenues are realized. So um, I think uh, uh, articulating what is important uh, uh, against whether whether we're really thinking about uh, a short term or a long term, or because we're indifferent about it, weighing those equally is is the only way to um, to address it. But well, uh, you know, and 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 I I hear you, uh, but there's but there's no reason um, that uh, an individual commissioner can't. Um, uh, in other words, we couldn't create some some broad, general, agreed upon way of doing things. And then in terms of trying to do one's own assessment, one could use a variety of different ways so long as we're all clear as to, as to the collective weight we place on things. Right. So we could also look at alternative systems right. as we're going through right. this. I mean, you may be developing right. one. You might right. want to take a stab at it and come up with a different kind of ranking right. and talk about it. Right. Right. Are you um, willing to sort of add this on to the task and the two mer sort of merge together, take that on in the, as the same yes. task? Yes, I think they fit together, and, right. I'm, and I, right. that's what I would hope to, to uh, start getting some drafts out fairly quickly. Okay. And uh, Which and I think also means, talk. which also means if, if any of us have thoughts about other evaluation criteria or ways to articulate the existing evaluation criteria right. that we want to get on the table, now's the time to do it. And we've right. all... We've all been having conversations about with different kinds of organizations about uh, about ways to manifest right. the values in the legislation. Now's the time to put those on a piece of paper right. and get them to Commissioner McHugh. I think, right. and we'll okay. combine them and, and talk about them, talk yeah. about them in these meetings and a series of these meetings, and right. then come up with a plan at the end and have public comment. Just one one last question that occurred to me on this: Have you thought about, or has anybody thought about, whether? Once we go through this kind of analysis and, and rating process, whether we would want to have a sort of a best and final situation, um, will we be going back to the applicants and saying, "Okay, here's either here's where you stand, or maybe you don't." I mean, is there? Do we do we want this? If you if we have no if we have no competition, I think we clearly would likely have some kind of iterative process. Do we want an iterative bidding process? Uh, in a competitive situation. Well, I, um, that's, that's certainly within the procurement regulations that, that we have when we purchase goods and services. Um, it's always um, reserved as an option, depending on, we, we could be in a scenario that Commissioner McHugh was describing, if there's a very tight, um, in the end, let's say, scoring, and um, um, there, there, that, that, that is a cr clear example of when a best and final is, is more suitable. Mm -hmm. Um, it's um, it's important to, to caution. It's it's important to say that the best and final should always be uh, made as a, as a as an option, because if you signal that you will do it, then the applicant has the incentive to reserve the best and final for <coughs> later. Right. So um, it, it, and so the, the, dyna the dynamics of, of which uh, just need to be considered. Right. Uh, I would I would reserve it as an option. Yeah. Of the commission. I think that probably, uh, do you have a thought on that? I would not take it off the table, um, but um, I, would not, I would not take it off the table, but yeah. I'd be very careful about yeah. doing that. But, yeah, um, I, I, I think you're both are saying the same thing. Same I, same I think thing. I agree with that. I, I, for one thing, you know, I, I sort of don't like the idea of a, of a bitter knowing that once they put their great idea on the table, everybody else is going to have a chance to match their great idea, you know, which, which defeats their, the incentive to really be innovative. But, um, but by the way, the best and final is usually reserved to the monetary piece when, when doing a procurement. 
if we were, um, and, and we'd have to think about what exactly that means for, for, for a yes, license yeah, here. Right. But um, when, when we're doing goods and services, it's, it's, you qualify and you're deemed that you will be right. able to, uh, to carry this out. That's, that's one thing, and, and, and it's only the best and final that has a component on the cost. Right. Do, do we, in, in, in thinking through this scenario, though, but in some of the discussion here about the scoring, are we not putting ourselves in a position of may, maybe going back and having an impact on the local process, the local approval, the local project, the local referendum, by suddenly switch, not, not switching gears, but the focus of the project becomes something that maybe the local community in the end would not have voted to approve. Didn't vote on. Yeah. Oh. There, there, I think there is some, I was thinking the same thing, I think there is some potential risk to that. I mean, it, as a practical matter, the, the, the developers are going to have to be talking about what they're going to do in pretty broad, pretty broad detail because that's what the community is going to vote on and they're going to want to put their best foot forward. And, um, but they might have, you know, some, some might want to hold back some kind of a non-controversial amenity or something. I don't know. I, I think we want to structure this somehow in a way, particularly in a competitive environment, we want to structure this in a way that incents the operators to bid as aggressively and as creatively and innovatively as they possibly can um, without feeling like we're sort of um, you know mar you know stealing their good ideas and marketing them around everybody else so there's some line to be walked here in, in how we do this but yeah I, and, 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 and <clears throat> I agree with that and I don't know whether I can say much more but but in a, in a typical procurement, you're trying to get the highest value at the lowest cost, and that's pretty quantifiable. That's not what we're trying to do here. And, and therefore, that model has, it seems to me, a limited utility, not a non-existent utility. It's, it's out there. But, it, but it, has, um, it is not a tight fit with what we're doing here. Right. And that's that was the that was the basis for my saying I would be very reluctant to to uh, go in that in that direction. Right. Okay. So I think we don't need to vote. I mean, the the, uh, the question actually was um, uh, what if any criteria in addition to those listed uh, in 15 and 18 and. Uh, how should those criteria be weighted, ranked, or scored? I think we're taking a partial step towards that, um, but but a big one. And in the next four to six weeks, we will have come up with the, all of the detailed answers to those questions, it sounds like. Um, that is all of the topics that were on the agenda today. And I think since we've got a meeting at 1, we should call it a day. Anybody want to move adjourn? So moved. Or say anything else, first of all, before? No, let's adjourn. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. We'll be back here at 1 o'clock. <laughs>